Pesto is definitely something that has earned a place in every kitchen, whether you're a home cook or a restaurant owner. Pesto has such a large variety of uses, it's cheap to make, it tastes awesome, and pairs well with almost any dish. An ingredient like that definitely deserves its own video. So today I present to you the Pesto Manifesto. Call it Manifesto. Sorry, had to. Mmm. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dishes and Fishes where I show you how to cook and set hooks. Right about now in the summer, you probably have an abundance of fresh ingredients and you probably have a lot of leftover vegetables in your fridge and in your garden. And pesto is the perfect thing to make with these things because it stores for a long time, you can use it on a lot of different dishes, and it's awesome. So today we're gonna to take an in-depth look at what pesto actually is, and I'm gonna show you two pesto recipes that are very unique that you definitely need to make at home. So let's get into it. Thanks John for showing me these recipes. Now before we get into the actual recipes for today's video, it's important to understand that like tacos from my last video, there's really no rules when it comes to making pesto. While there aren't any specific rules to follow, there's several categories of ingredients that I think make up a good pesto. So I created a little table to help you guys understand. Let's take a look. All right guys, this chart encompasses the six categories of ingredients that make up pesto. And the first one is oil. When it comes to the oil, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're using a good quality, neutral or good tasting oil, such as extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, grapeseed oil. I would avoid oils like vegetable and canola. Try to use a healthy natural oil as we're gonna be eating it raw and it's gonna set the tone for the entire pesto. I use this extra virgin olive oil for most things. It's the cheapest, most accessible oil at my local grocery store, and I think it tastes pretty good. In my chart, I said to chill the oil prior to making the pesto. This allows you for more time to infuse, and you can see this strategy in my salmon skillet basil oil video. The next category of ingredients is aromatics. These are gonna provide what I call a flavor bomb to the pesto and give it a depth that can't really be achieved without aromatics. Without aromatics, pesto honestly is pretty flat. Garlic is obviously the most traditional aromatic, but you can use everything from shallots, yellow and white onions, green onions, and we're actually gonna be using peppers today as our aromatics. The list goes on, there's probably many other things that you could use, but one thing that we're gonna do today is actually roast the aromatics. This actually transforms the entire flavor of the aromatics, as you know. So we're actually gonna be using roasted garlic and some roasted onions and peppers. To roast my garlic, I like to just cut the tops off, wrap it in aluminum foil with some olive oil, salt, and pepper, and roast it in the oven at 400 degrees for one to one and a half hours until it is nice and golden brown. And then you can kind of just squeeze it out and use it however you'd like. The next category of ingredient are nuts and seeds. These are gonna provide texture and a nutty flavor to the pesto. Pine nuts are kind of the cornerstone nut in pestos, but you can use anything from cashews, pistachios, almonds, walnuts, and more. If you are allergic to tree nuts, my favorite seed to use is sunflower seeds. You can also use flax seeds. No matter what nut or seed that you choose, one thing that I recommend doing is toasting the nuts before you grind them in your pesto. Simply just do this in a saute pan until they are warm and browned. This is going to transform their flavor. Next we've got cheese. And cheese, especially Parmesan, provides a salty boost to your pesto. And there are a lot of other cheeses out there that provide a savory hit, such as Romano, Gruyere, or aged provolone. Regardless, always make sure that you use a hard aged cheese, none of those soft melty cheeses, and make sure that you grate it yourself. Yourself. A lot of the time, pre-grated cheeses have preservatives and anti-clumping agents in them that we're going to avoid. When I make pesto, I either use Romano cheese or Parmesan or Reggiano. And no matter what I use, I always grate it myself. Romano cheese has a stronger flavor, Parmesan cheese has a saltier flavor. One of the pestos today I'll use Romano cheese and the other one I will use Parmesan. Now the main flavor of any pesto is going to be found in the primary herb. Most pestos out there feature basil as the main herb, but honestly you can do this with any strong flavored herb. Some of my favorites include cilantro, parsley, arugula, 
ramps when they're in season in the spring, and mint. This can get expensive if you're using these ingredients in the off season. So what I'll do is go to the farmer's market and whatever they have in abundance is what I'll make my pesto out of. This is cheap and also gets you the best quality pesto that money can buy. And lastly, we've got our secondary greens. A lot of the time these are used to add volume to the pesto or color and they complement the primary herb in the pesto. You can use any combination of primary and secondary green. You can even use multiple things from the same category in this chart. But when I think of secondary greens, I think of things like kale leaves, not the stems, spinach, leftover carrot tops, sorrel when it's in abundance at the farmer's market, and other things I've used include broccoli rob and artichokes. Basically any leftover green can be used as a secondary green. There are a lot of things that fall into these categories that simply wouldn't fit on the chart, so use your imagination. Keep a lookout on my website for this chart, it'll be available for download soon. So let's get into these pesto recipes. The first pesto that we're going to make is a hot and sweet pesto that uses onion, shallot, and local peppers. I'm going to start by peeling my onion and shallot and then cutting them into large chunks. These are all going to get roasted and pureed so they don't have to be perfectly cut. And I'm going to put those into a cast iron pan along with my peppers. Each year one of the farms near my house has these beautiful cherry peppers. They're hot, they're delicious. You can also find them in my Calabrian pepper relish video on my channel. And these Hungarian wax peppers I got in my backyard so I'm going to use those up too. I'm going to coat all that stuff in olive oil, salt, and pepper and I'm going to get that roasted off in my oven at 400 degrees for 50 15 to 20 minutes or until they are softened. Once they're sizzling and softened up, I'm gonna pull them out and I'm going to put my peppers in a bowl and wrap it in saran wrap and set it on my counter for 20 to 30 minutes so they can steam and allow me to remove the seeds and ribs. I'll also set my roasted onions and shallots aside. After 20 minutes, my peppers should be nice and steamy. I'm gonna just pull them apart and remove the seeds and ribs. You can peel these if you want to as well. I'm not going to though for this pesto. Make sure you wash your hands after handling hot cherry peppers. And I'm going to set my container of roasted pepper flesh, no seeds, to the side. For the nuts for this pesto, we're going to be using candied walnuts. So in a saute pan, I'm going to put one cup of walnuts and one quarter cup of sugar, as well as a pinch of salt just to enhance the flavor. And I'm going to cook those over medium heat, constantly stirring so they don't burn, until the sugar melts, coats the walnuts, and candies them. Take your time, make sure you keep stirring. Once they're all candied, I'm going to set them on a sill pad and spread them out so they can cool off and not stick together. These are super, super addicting, by the way. And now we're ready to make our pesto. So in a food processor, I'm going to combine my candied walnuts and my Romano cheese. Anytime I make pesto, I always like to grate the nuts and cheese first, followed by my roasted peppers, my roasted onions and shallots, and I'm going to pulse that until combined. Then I will add one bunch of parsley, and one ounce of basil. And then with any pesto, you're going to stream in olive oil until it reaches the desired consistency. Season with salt and pepper, and just like that, you have a delicious, hot and sweet pesto. That's number one. For number two, we're going to start with a can of white beans. I'm going to drain and rinse these beans, and then I'm going to use three bulbs of roasted garlic. In a blender, I'm going to combine my four ounces of white beans with my three bulbs of roasted garlic. And I'm gonna blend that on very low speed with some olive oil until it forms a nice cohesive bean-free paste. Also make sure you season this with salt and pepper. I'm gonna use broccoli rabe in this pesto. So in a sauce pot, I'm gonna get that broccoli rabe nice and warm until it is softened. And once it's softened, I'm going to shock it in an ice bath and set it aside to cool. For my nuts for this dish, I'm gonna use cashews. Like I said, I'm just gonna to toast those off quickly in a saute pan and set those aside. Now we got our mise en place for our second pesto. So the first thing we're gonna do is combine our cashews and our Parmesan cheese in a food processor and grind it up. Once they are incorporated, I'm going to squeeze the water out of the broccoli rabe and dump it in with three ounces of basil. Then I'm going to stream in olive oil until it is a little bit thinner and remove it into a bowl. In that bowl, I'm going to fold in my white bean roasted garlic mixture. I'm gonna adjust the seasoning with a little bit of salt and at the end, I'm going to add one teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes for a nice little zing. And that's it, guys. You can use pesto for so many things. You can use it on proteins, either marinating them or finishing proteins with it. You can use it in red or creamy pasta sauces. You can combine it with some mayo and have a nice pesto mayo for your sandwiches. I like heirloom tomatoes, by the way. And you can freeze it. When you freeze it, you want to make sure that once you have your pesto in your container that you top it very generously with a layer of oil. This layer is going to prevent the pesto from getting oxidized, freezer burnt, and it'll last in your freezer for three to four months. This is another reason why I like to make big batches of pesto because I can keep a lot in my freezer. 
And we are actually going to be making some fancy sourdough pesto snacks. So I'm going to start by just cutting up a sourdough loaf into some toast, browning off some local Connecticut sausage, and cutting up some local heirloom tomatoes into chunks for my sourdough toast. So in a cast iron pan, I'm going to mop up two tablespoons of butter with my sourdough toast until they are nice and golden brown and crispy. And let's build these fancy toasts. So the first one, I'm going to put down my broccoli rabe and basil pesto. Make sure that pesto goes edge to edge, followed by my browned local sausage. And I'm going to garnish it with parsley. And that's it. Such a simple snack, but a very enjoyable depth of flavor and an awesome bite. For the next one, we're going to put down our hot and sweet pesto edge to edge, as well as some orange and red heirloom tomatoes. I love heirloom tomatoes. Some mozzarella cheese pearls and garnish it with a chiffonade of local basil. I got to say, I like this one a little bit better but you can't go wrong with either one and that's it guys be creative when it comes to making pestos try these two recipes out in your own kitchens let me know if you do and as always thanks for watching